There we go. All right. Okay. Oh. You can go ahead and good, start. Good morning, everybody, uh, or good evening, where I am. Um, uh, thanks for, um, Sandra, for inviting me to uh, I, I give a, a, an overview of uh, about viruses in Dahlia. Um, I'm at uh, Washington State University um, in Pullman, that is in uh, Eastern Washington. Uh, I'm a professor in the Department of Plant Pathology uh, here at uh, WSU. And interestingly, today is actually a commencement day at, uh, at WSU. Uh, so I expect a lot of, lot of students, proud seniors and their parents uh, going around town. Um, and also I uh, hold a, 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 a chairship, if you will, uh, an endowment created by uh, Jim Chui. Um, it's named after Carl and uh, James uh, Chui here at uh, WSU. Uh, specifically uh, with that endowment, uh, what happened is that uh, we were able to create a, a clean Dahlia center uh, focusing on research on Dahlia and Dahlia viruses and for Dahlia improvement overall and uh, made possible by initially by uh, a professorship that was created by the American Dahlia Society. And then uh, with a, a very generous donation from Jim Chui, uh, the Clean Dahlia Center actually uh, happened. Uh, so again, um, I cannot thank enough uh, Jim Chui uh, for, for his uh, uh, support for over, over a number of years and uh, Dr. Ron Miner who joined uh, today's uh, meeting uh, has been a, a great uh, supporter of uh, research on Dahlia viruses here at WSU. So those of you who haven't been to WSU or Pullman, um, well, I hope you do because you haven't seen heaven yet. Okay, uh, I'm probably a bit biased. So we are located in the southeastern corner of the state, uh, Pullman here. I think uh, hopefully you see my uh, pointer, uh, very close to Idaho State Line. Uh, so it's about six miles from Idaho State Line and we have another land grant university across the state line in Moscow, Idaho. So Washington State University is a land grant university uh, like uh, Michigan State, uh, Ohio State, and several other uh, uh, similar universities in different uh, uh, states in the country. Uh, another one close to us uh, is Oregon State, for example. Um, and and uh, so we are on the eastern edge uh, of, of the state and uh, uh, the western part of the state, Seattle, and then north, if you go north, uh, Snohomish County, Skagit County, Whatcom, and then to the south, uh, King, uh, Pierce County, uh, he, probably those who haven't been to uh, Western Washington, uh, uh, the, the climate is very conducive for growing beautiful, beautiful dahlias. And again, I'm maybe biased a bit, but uh, in my opinion, dahlia is the most beautiful flower created by Mother Nature. Uh, uh, Pullman campus, uh, a quick kind of a pictorial uh, tour. Um, we are in the Palouse region of Eastern Washington, a beautiful rolling hills. Uh, Dr. Miner visited us. Uh, those of you uh, who haven't, and if you happen to be in Seattle area, please let me know and uh, uh, visit us. I'll be glad to uh, walk you through some of the research that's going on in my lab and also uh, uh, drive you around the campus. It's a, a very beautiful campus. So uh, my laboratory building is located, the lab is located in this uh, building uh, named after Orville Vogel. Uh, he was a, a very well-known uh, plant breeder in uh, what from 30s to 60s on WSU campus. And some of you probably or most of you heard about Green Revolution, uh, basically, uh, development of new wheat varieties that were introduced into the Indian subcontinent in the 60s that essentially doubled and tripled wheat production in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, and, and what used to be India as an importer of wheat in a couple of decades be, became an exporter of wheat. And that green revolution happened because of new high yielding wheat varieties. And the genes for those high yielding trade came from the germplasm from Washington State. And Dr. Vogel was one of the plant breeders behind that uh, 
a huge success story. So inside my lab, uh, typically those of you who have, who have been to university labs, uh, you know, they're pretty much the same. Um, but when you look through this window out uh, on a Saturday home game, we straight look into the football stadium. So it's a, a very nice uh, a location for my lab. So probably you wonder that we, we get any work done on Saturdays if there's a home game. Um, <clears throat> today, I'm going to give a quick overview uh, of uh, about Dahlia viruses. I think some of you probably heard this talk multiple times, like uh, Ron Miner and Randy. Uh, but I kind of put these slides together to kind of bring awareness, increase awareness among those who haven't uh, paid much attention to plants that look sick in your garden. And maybe some of you probably ignored them. Uh, but the impact of that in the long term can be serious. So years ago, the Dahlia stakeholder group identified viruses as a major uh, <clears throat> issue that uh, where research needs to be done to understand more. And so today I'm going to quickly go over some of the symptoms that are uniquely associated with virus infections. Right? And then a bit of a, a basic information about how these viruses spread. And uh, <clears throat> most of you are familiar with uh, the virus testing service that we are offering to clubs and vendors here at WSU. Uh, this was again supported by Jim Chui uh, and a series of articles in the ADS bulletin uh, with the details also on the ADS website, how to submit samples and all that. So I won't spend much time on that. And then I prepared a series of uh, fre frequently asked questions about questions that I get during my talks. And if there is some time left, <clears throat> I will quickly kind of go over some of the ongoing uh, research and development activities. Mm -hmm. So again, this was put together by uh, Dr. Miner, um, foliage appearance and if virus is involved. Right? So we clearly established that yes, certain symptoms are definitely caused by a virus. Right? So some of us want to know, hey, if my plant has a virus, and others may want to know which one, because dahlias are known to be infected by at least half a dozen viruses, right? I'll go over that. And over the years, I prepared uh, uh, brochures. Uh, some of them came in the ADS bulletin uh, to essentially draw attention to virus plants in your gardens and how to identify them. And, and so the best option would be to, to throw it out, not to keep them, right? And Linda Taylor uh, from Oregon, uh, she spent a lot of time and effort in pulling together various images uh, of uh, virus infections. And she made an album. So I encourage you to uh, check it out. Um, it's a, a very a well done compilation. Mm -hmm. uh, so you should be able to uh, pull it out on your smartphone while you're walking in the garden and hold that right next to a, a leaf of a, of a plant that looks odd. And so give you have an idea if that particular plant had potentially had a virus. Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, over the last several years, we tested thousands of samples for different viruses. And it turned out there are about half a dozen of them that we find recurring every year. Uh, each virus is kind of a mouthful, uh, tobacco streak, uh, tomato spotted wilt, impatience necrotic spot, and, these, and, and dahlia mosaic, and rarely cucumber mosaic. So the tradition that uh, we use uh, the virologists all over the world in naming a virus is that uh, what is the host plant from which it was a new virus was found? In this case, this number one, the virus is on, on the list, it was first isolated from tobacco. But it doesn't mean that it infects only tobacco. It turned out that this particular virus can infect hundreds of different species, including dahlia. Second one, tomato spotted wilt, same thing. 
it was first found in tomato. So that's why it's named after tomato. But this one is so notorious, it can infect more than 2000 different plant species. Very wide host range. Dahlia is one of them. So uh, we have an insider joke among virologists that uh, tomato spotted wilt virus has such a wide host range. If there is no green plant, possibly it can infect a lamppost. So it, it has such a, a, a wide host range. So what does it mean? Managing viruses that have a very wide host range, it becomes a challenge. Because if you are taking good care of dahlias, no tomato spotted wilt virus, but Weeds surrounding your garden could harbor this virus because this virus infects a lot of weeds. So some viruses that have very wide host range, they are still continue to be a problem, even though they were discovered almost 100 years ago. So you may ask, oh, okay, you're, you guys are working on this virus for so many decades. How come this is still a problem? Mainly because some of them have a very wide host range. So impatience necrotic spot is again a very common virus in Dahlia. So we see quite a bit. And over the years, we discovered that there are new viruses in Dahlia called Dahlia mosaic virus. Right? <clears throat> again, many of them produce a very unique symptoms. And I'll quickly go over that. So that if you see these symptoms in your garden, you can be 100% sure that that plant is virused. So one common symptom uh, <clears throat> is chlorosis along the veins. Right? So that is a, a very typical symptom of virus infection. Uh, chlorosis means breakdown of chlorophyll. Right? So you end up seeing dark green and light green uh, streaks, if you will. So a very common symptom for virus infection is what we call mosaic. Again, a, a random mixture of green and dark green and light green eye lengths, if you will. Right? So mosaic essentially is a generic term, but it is specifically used to describe a symptom of virus infection. So no other uh, uh, <clears throat> situation or, uh, or a, a symptom that uh, is associated with any other uh, reason, bacteria or fungi or any other pathogen, uh, we don't use this term. So if you say that, oh, I have some mosaic, chances are that it is caused by a virus. And I just mentioned about chlorosis or yellowing is because of breakdown of uh, chlorophyll, uh, but there is a very distinct pattern of chlorosis here because this yellowing can be because of nutritional disorders also. So I have a couple of examples a little later, all right? So what happens, this chlorosis, if, if it continues, the entire plant turns yellow. Essentially, they produce no flowers and they remain stunted, right? So what can start as a very benign, mild, mosaic-like symptoms can really progress under right conditions for the virus and can lead to hunting and, and total alloying. So viruses do damage uh, dahlia right? if, if, if we ignore them. So again, severe cases where the plant just remains stunted, does not grow, no flowers. And that's a, a, this is a very telltale sign of a virus infection here. Uh, I see some uh, messages, uh, I think, posted on chat. Uh, I, I, I'll check uh, just in a while. Another unique symptom by virus infection is this what we call fan leaf. So this very distinct pattern of breakdown of uh, chlorophyll leading to this wavy kind of a pattern is uh, associated with the virus infection. So you can be 100% sure that it is a virus plant. On the other end, if you see this kind of a blackening on the stems, this could be a virus or this could be a fungus. So hard to tell. So in this case, we need to run a, a lab test to rule in or rule out a virus. This is again a, a, a fan leaf pattern. Hopefully you get to see that arrow is pointing out those very distinct lines. And this is again, 
caused by a virus, in this case, tomato spotted wilt virus. So uh, very definitive uh, in this case. And a close up here, what we call a ring spot. Uh, several rings, as you can see. Um, and, and this is again caused by uh, a different virus called impatience necrotic spot. Again, the name came from uh, originally the virus was first isolated from impatience and it causes these necrotic spots and ring spots. But this particular virus infects many ornamentals, dozens and dozens of ornamentals. Again, uh, ring spots more extensive, leading to what we call netting. So these ring spots are kind of coming together and joining and leading to this netting type of thing, a symptom. 100% uh, you can be sure that this plant is virus. A close up of the same leaf. Uh, you can see those ring spots are coming together and cause a kind of a net like a appearance. Right. So uh, if any of you are thinking that, oh, this looks beautiful, it's like an art, uh, that means there's a plant pathologist inside you. Right. And um, because we, we tend to appreciate how these viruses actually interact with the plant and overcome the plant's defense and multiply inside the plant and cause these symptoms, what we see as symptoms, is a manifestation of uh, this interaction, a fight between virus and the plant. And sometimes the virus wins, you see these symptoms, and sometimes the plant wins and the virus gets suppressed. I'll show you a couple of examples of that. So this is an ongoing uh, <clears throat> arms race, if you will, between virus and its host, whether it's dahlias or in a commercial field production like potatoes or, or onions or apples. So uh, Dr. Miner again put this, uh, some of these slides together. Uh, as I mentioned, some of the symptoms uh, can be caused by nutritional deficiencies. So there is a, a very good uh, resource, uh, a YouTube presentation. Uh, <clears throat> the link is here. Uh, and they've compiled some of the symptoms that are because of nutritional disorders. But many of them can be distinguished from those caused by a virus, many of them. Right? But at the first look, uh, if you have only virus in the back of your mind, uh, we tend to say, oh, this could be virus. But a closer examination uh, you should be able to tell them apart. Is it because of nutrition or because of virus? Okay. So here is an example. Uh, this is uh, because of a, a iron deficiency. As you can see, the chlorosis is more kind of a, a general spread over all the leaf, whereas typically the chlorosis associated with the virus infection typically goes along the veins. Again, why, you may ask, it, it depends on how the virus moves from a point of infection on the leaf to the rest of the leaf. And the, it, 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 as a result, because these veins are the main uh, conduits for flow of nutrients in the plant, so the virus also moves along those xylem and phloem. So that's why we see that virus affect along the veins in case of virus infection, where in case of nutritional disorders, it's more of a, a random and generalized spread of the CLOE. So quickly, um, I think uh, Dr. Miner knows when I start talking about viruses, I keep going, but I keep checking my watch. Um, for the last few years, uh, we've been testing samples submitted by various clubs and vendors. And uh, the most important uh, take home and an encouraging uh, message is that uh, the old saying that all, all dahlias have virus is not true. Uh, the reason that I think that came about is because it turned out that a small piece of viral DNA is actually inserted in the dahlia chromosomes. So if you test for that small piece, every dahlia will test positive, leading to the conclusion, oh, all dahlias have virus. But what folks were detecting at the time was just a small piece of DNA of viral origin, but not virus, right? So it turned out that, that not all virus have 
Dahlia cell viruses, and that was debunked. Um, and over the last few years from the testing, we came to know that tobacco streak virus seems to be the most prevalent virus. Uh, why is it important to know what virus we ha I have in my garden? Because each virus behaves differently. Each virus is spread differently from plant to plant. And each virus is different in how persistent it is during the season and then during storage and to the next season. Right? That's why it's important to know not only that, oh, my garden has a virus versus, oh, my garden has this virus is more common than the other viruses. Okay? So that helps in managing them. So how's this spread? Between plants during the season, it's mostly by insects, but not all insects, because these viruses develop a very specific and a close association with only a certain type of insect. And these insects essentially, while feeding on the plant, they pick up the virus, and then when they land on another plant, again, during the process of feeding, literally inject the virus into the, uh, another plant. And another uh, one that we notice uh, how the virus is spreading during the season is we are spreading it. So not only just insects. So I tend to blame insects, but mm, I think some a little bit of self-blame also is uh, warranted. Okay. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how to address that, uh, gardening tools and implements that we use, uh, unknowingly we are spreading them. So one of the insects that uh, spreads these, many of the viruses in Zalia is thrips. Most of you are familiar with this, very tiny ones, hard to see with a naked eye. Uh, we need a magnifying glass. Um, and there's different kinds of thrip species. Some are more uh, prevalent uh, in the East Coast versus Midwest versus out here in Pacific Northwest. And that species composition also influences what virus is prevalent in a particular region, right? Uh, Pacific Northwest versus uh, Mid-Atlantic, for example. Mm -hmm. um, so take home message is only there are few types of insects spread the virus during the season between plant to plant and between gardens as well, because some of them can fly long distances, several miles along the wind, wind current. Right? So again, that makes the control very difficult because virtually it's impossible to eliminate these thrips unless we nuke them, right? which is environmentally not friendly, right? So uh, here you can see the infestation on the plants uh, if, if the numbers are very high. And another group of insects that you are familiar with that spread viruses in Dahlia are aphids. Again, quickly, it is a cartoon of an aphid feeding on a leaf. It literally, physically, inserts its mouth part, stylet, and introduces a little bit of saliva because the plant sap is very acidic, very thick. So it dilutes it with its saliva and then sucks the uh, plant sap. So if this particular leaf, if this particular plant cell had virus, naturally the virus also gets picked up. And when this aphid takes off and lands on another plant, again, starts probing and feeding, a virus gets introduced into another plant. So thrips and aphids essentially, they have these mouth parts, what we call sucking type. Compared to beetles, they just chew. Physically, they chew the leaf, right? Whereas aphids and thrips, they suck the sap using this needle. Basically, it looks like a syringe. Right? So for Dahlia viruses, it turned out that they are, most of them are spread by either aphid or thrips, nothing else, because you may run into beetles and all kinds of bugs in your garden, but there's no evidence that any of them spread these viruses. So keeping the numbers down, for example, in a contained growth conditions like uh, greenhouses, uh, commercial production facilities, uh, they try to keep track of the numbers of these aphids and thrips, and they have a, a, a a, a well-defined uh, regimen of uh, using insecticides uh, in commercial production systems to keep the numbers down. Because we know that these two are the major contributors for spreading these viruses from plant to plant during the season. Okay. So 
How do you manage them? Uh, there are some facts. So one, uh, plant gets sick, infected with the virus. Uh, there's little, very little thing uh, we can do to cure it. Um, unlike other pathogens like fungi, uh, you can spray a fungicide that selectively targets and kills that fungus. Uh, antibiotics, they target bacterial infections and kill the bacteria. Strep throat that we get, right? we take a, an antibiotic and we get better. In case of viruses so far, we don't have any chemicals that we can spray that will target the virus and kill it. Right? Even though there are a lot of disinfectants out there and they say that, oh, it kills 99% of the flu virus and all that, uh, it's a hype, right? more than a fact. So that's the reason why uh, the message in case of managing viruses in perennial crops uh, is once is, a plant is infected, it's better to get rid of it rather than trying to uh, cure it uh, because we don't have any chemicals to do that. So early detection of infected plants goes a long way and discarding infected plants because then you are minimizing further spread. Remember, during the season, if you have a high insect numbers like trips and aphids, and if you have one virus plant that becomes a source for these insects during the process of feeding, pick it up and spread them to other plants. So getting rid of this source really reduces virus infections um, in, during the season and, and down the road. Okay. And disinfecting tools, I'll, uh, uh, you probably got this message uh, through the articles in the bulletin, uh, uh, really goes a long way. Okay. Uh, here are the disinfectants that we recommend. Uh, there's uh, some research has been done and several disinfectants were tried. And these are the most uh, effective in minimizing the carryover or the contamination from if you started with an infected plant and you use the same tool, uh, you are likely to spread the virus to uh, subsequently to others. So 10% 10, 10 household bleach is the most effective, but it has its disadvantages. It's corrosive, uh, it's not safe. Um, but uh, a detergent, we tried down, uh, works as well. Uh, and then Vircon, yes, this is commercially available on the internet. Uh, it has been used in veterinary uh, situations as a disinfectant for years and years. Uh, that, this also turned out to be equally, equally good. So it's your choice, but uh, we highly recommend uh, using any one of them. Uh, and some of you use a combination, bleach followed by a detergent solution, even better. Um, but uh, doing something is better than nothing because unintentionally we will be spreading the virus with contaminated tool. Right? So uh, a, a, a few frequently asked questions. Uh, next few slides. Um, I get this a lot. Uh, I pulled out a disease plant because I confirmed through testing or what have you that it is virus. Is it okay to plant in the same soil again? A very good question. It, it depends. If the disease was due to a virus, you may plant again in the same soil because many dahlia viruses do not survive in soil. They need a living host plant, right? So you are okay to, but if the disease was because of a fungus and many of the fungi can live in the soil, even if there is no plant there during off season. And so if you plant in same soil again, that fungus comes to life and infect the roots and damages the plant, right? So that's why it, 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 if, if, we, if your plant is virus, it's okay to plant again. Some of you say, I get this also, I really take good care of my plants and I don't see much of a disease issues. Very good, I'm glad to hear that. That's where ultimately we want to go. Um, again, a plant gets sick because of a disease or a pathogen infection if it is stressed. So stress is like, this is more of an issue in a commercial production of potatoes or what have you. Uh, we, we emphasize that uh, stress, avoid stress, like lack of water or poor soil, they weaken the plant and plants become more prone to infection. 
compared to a healthy, vigorously growing plant can fight it off. Right? So I think you're doing everything right if you don't see any disease issues in your garden. So is it possible to make dahlias resistant to virus? Uh, very good question. In fact, for managing viruses, whether it's in product, edible crops, corn, soybean, wheat, rice, uh, the most effective way to manage viruses is to make, develop, or produce resistant varieties. There are a lot of success stories in case of edible crops uh, where we have resistant varieties so that the viruses can damage them. <clears throat> in case of dahlias, we are not there yet, but anecdotal evidence is that uh, those dahlias that have dark foliage tend to have less disease. These are some of the older dahlias. <clears throat> we con consistently see that they have less virus infections. That suggests that they probably have some genes for uh, virus resistance. Essentially, resistance is governed by genes and identifying them and then moving them into other varieties takes time. You know, it's a, a long process. For example, to develop a new potato variety for resistance to a disease takes anywhere between 12 to 15 years. And assuming that you identified a source of resistance, that uh, resistant genes. Right? So it's a long uh, process. And, and uh, we are getting started again, thanks to the support from the American Dahlia Society and various societies in, 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 in the US and uh, uh, the Chewy Foundation uh, that uh, uh, <clears throat> now we have a team of scientists here at WSU and Auburn University. Um, uh, we started a project to look at the, the DNA, the genome of Dahlia, selected Dahlia, and what genes they code for, and are there any genes that we can use for virus resistance? So a phase one is to identify genes that can provide resistance to virus. So, so we are hopeful that of, of that uh, outcome down the road, right? So it's not yet. So we don't have any varieties that are known to be resistant to that, yes, except some anecdotal uh, evidence. This is very common. Some of my plants look diseased, but new growth, younger leaves looked fine. No symptoms, nothing. So why is that? <clears throat> why? Because if the plants are vigorously growing, they tend to fight back and try to recover from the disease. What does it mean? That means the virus is multiplied, cause some symptoms, but the plant growth outpaced. So virus is not able to keep up the, with the plant growth. And so the younger leaves tend to be uh, symptom free. They look perfectly healthy, right? But the caveat is, it does not mean that the plant is completely free of virus. It is still has a lot of virus, only the younger part of it is free of virus, right? So that, again, that's something important to keep in mind. And this is what we see in the field situation in commercial crops as well whether it is a soybean or potato or what have you. Right? Again, I get this a lot. Okay, my plant was a little sick, but flowers are just fine. You know, <clears throat> why can't I ignore uh, because this leaves look funny, you know, uh, or odd, right? So should I keep using the tubers cutting from these plants? It's not a good idea. Right? because these viruses tend to be systemic. That means they tend to spread throughout the plant uh, usually with exceptions, right? Some viruses tend to be more localized in only one part of the plant and not spread throughout the plant. Right? So, but if, if you have beautiful flowers, but leaves looked odd and you got the plant tested and it is virused, it's a good idea not to keep them, not to save the tubers, because the viruses can be transferred from uh, through tubers to the next season. So 
virus are spreading during the season from plant to plant. So what can I do to reduce it? Disinfecting tools is one of the most effective ways. Uh, Dr. Miner over the years collected quite a bit of data uh, that showed that yes, you know, and it, it, it is a, a standard practice in commercial production uh, operations, whether it is uh, uh, dahlias or, or <clears throat> African violets or lilies or roses or tulips. It is a standard operating procedure. So again, I mentioned briefly about this. Uh, is there something that I can spray to cure my sick plants so that they come out healthy? No, we don't have any uh, <clears throat> such uh, chemicals to kill a virus from a disease plant. The reason again why uh, it is very difficult to design a chemical, synthesize a chemical that can selectively target only the virus in the infected plant. Because again, it, because the reason is that the virus biology is such that uh, it cannot be distinguished from its DNA or RNA from plant's DNA and RNA. So the plant virus biology is very similar to, to human viruses like, like COVID. So right now we don't have any uh, 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 a drug that uh, we can take a tablet or something to kill the COVID. So the best way is to get a vaccination uh, to, to prevent uh, infection or minimize the effect of uh, infection. Okay. I, I get this question quite a bit. I pulled out a few disease plants because they turned out to be virus infected. Is it okay to compost them? My personal recommendation is it's better if you don't. Uh, again, it depends on the region. Where summer temperature is much higher, uh, the composting process could inactivate the viruses. Right? So, uh, because some of these viruses are very uh, labile or are prone to high temperatures and get inactivated. Right? But out of abundance of caution, it's better not to compost them. So again, what can I do about the bugs? Because some of them are spreading viruses you know, uh, in my garden. So far, their relative importance in disease spread uh, is, uh, in my observations, it's not that critical. But again, it depends on numbers. Because the numbers of the thrips and aphids tend to vary from year to year. Again, based because of the weather, how cold the previous winter was, so on and so forth. Right? And, and how many other hosts are around on which these insects can breed and build the populations. So all these contribute to uh, the insect numbers in a given season. Right? So uh, the importance of these insects spreading is there, but probably it's not that critical. Right? And Another thing that very practical that all of us can do is that if you see symptoms that I just showed uh, on any of your plants, removing the leaves right away uh, also reduces the spread of the virus because for the insect, there is no virus to pick up during feeding, right? So this is something, so observing your plants closely, especially not just at the flowers, which I do, but at the foliage uh, on a regular basis, and uh, then comparing with the with the with the pictorial that uh, Linda Taylor compiled, and and as I showed you some of the symptoms, you can be hundred percent sure that it is virus. Right? Initially, removing them and watching that plant and see if it continues to develop symptomatic leaves, then throwing it out, removing it as soon as possible can really reduce the virus levels, virus load in your garden. Again, which insects are important in spreading viruses in dahlia? Thrips, I showed you some uh, pictures, uh, and the aphids. So uh, it turned out that thrips transmit at least three different viruses in dahlias. And they're very difficult to control. Uh, we don't have very many insecticides that are effective. Um, and uh, so in 
home gardens uh, or small screen houses <clears throat> in your garden. We don't recommend any using insecticides. <clears throat> there are some bio pesticides in the market, uh, but the best or non-chemical way is to use yellow or blue sticky card. But again, in an open garden situation, uh, how effective these are, you know, but still it contributes to reducing uh, the numbers because these insects get tend to get attracted to these yellow or blue colors. So at least you're capturing some of them. So here's an example in my greenhouse. Again, in a greenhouse situation, we use it regularly, these blue and yellow sticky cards, and we count to keep track of the numbers on a weekly basis and replace them with new uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, sticky cards. Okay. Here's a, a close-up of a sticky card, as you can see, depending on, on the season, uh, these numbers vary. So, Again, basic steps, take home message. If in doubt, throw it out. And now we are offering a testing service. So if in doubt, get them tested so that you have a very definitive answer and save tubers from only the healthiest plants. Clean between, disinfect your tool, a 10% bleach solution and a darn dish detergent, very effective. And any ornamental plant, the mantra is start with a clean stock, whether it is dahlias or, or grape wine. Starting with a clean stock can go a long way. So I'll stop here um, so that I want to have some time to answer any questions you may have. Again, I thank uh, uh, Jim Chui, American Dahlia Society, Dr. Ron Miner, and uh, uh, by the, uh, <clears throat> there's a virus team consisting of uh, uh, Linda Taylor uh, <clears throat> and, and several others, uh, Brad, 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 Brad Freeman, uh, Nick Weber, uh, and quite a few others uh, that, who actually have been contributing some ideas for research and materials for testing, uh, for refining some of the virus detection methods and in and, and, and so many various ways. Right? So I can't uh, thank them enough. Right? Uh, again, start clean and stay clean is the mantra that we, uh, we try to convey from, from apples, literally from apples to, to um, <clears throat> every uh, plant species that is vegetatively propagated. So uh, I think that's where I'll uh, stop. Um, any questions? I'll stop uh, sharing the screen. And there are a few messages in the chat box. Thank you so much. Um, one question I have, so where do you get your blue and yellow sticky cards? Uh, online, there are quite a few places. Um, we we get them from our local university has a local uh, uh, store that's where we they buy in bulk. Uh, but there are quite a few uh, online sources. Are they just called sticky cards? Sticky cards, yes, yeah, yellow or blue, yeah. Okay. Uh, Doctor Papu. Yes. Can you tell us exactly where we would send dahlia material to be tested and how, what exactly, what material do you need? Uh, good question. Uh, I think that uh, information is available on the dahlia website. What, what kind of a foliage to uh, collect and send and where to send. Um, okay. And, and typically Dr. Miner uh, has been coordinating that uh, effort uh, from samples submitted from the clubs and vendors. Uh, because again, uh, Jim Chui uh, has been subsidizing the cost of testing. So Ron, you may want to pitch in. Uh, well, that says it very well, Anu. The uh, information is available for uh, uh, the entire process on the uh, ADS website. Okay, thanks. And a, a club organization 
I would suggest it be the best thing for you to pursue it because it ends up providing uh, a, a source of clean stock for the club in its, uh, in its auctions. There's a company called Agdia that claims they have a uh, test available that you can mm -hmm. do at home. Do you know of them? Ah, uh, yes, yeah. Yeah, it's a, it's a commercial testing company in uh, Elkhart, Indiana, just close to Chicago. Uh, yeah, they have been providing these uh, tests for dozens and dozens of viruses, fungi and bacteria. Uh, some of the tests you can do it at home. Uh, it is uh, basically a immuno strip, um, uh, like like the COVID at home test that we are doing now. So we became very good at that, all of us. Um, and uh, so very similar test. So you um, grind up the leaf, uh, <coughs> make the green juice, and uh, dip this uh, immuno strip in there. And in a three to five minutes, uh, it, uh, if it develops color, that means uh, that particular plant had virus. Uh, uh, it 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 has a very good utility uh, in certain situations where you want to know the result right away on a few plants. Uh, but for large scale testing, like if you have hundreds of samples to be tested, typically a lab based test is more practical and cost effective. And also a lab based test tends to be uh, more sensitive. Okay. Uh, so so these uh, yeah at home tests uh, are useful uh, in certain situations. Uh, and, and uh, but and also uh, because of the convenience, um, they're more expensive as well. Okay, thank you. Uh, I I think each trip costs about two or three dollars, I think. And and again, depends on which virus. I think the price varies. Uh, so yeah, they have been offering testing services for a long time uh, for a whole bunch of different crops and viruses. And uh, here at Clean Dahlia Center. Uh, 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 because we are a university-based uh, uh, service and it's because it's subsidized, so we are able to provide the service at cost. Good question. And you hear uh, on the chat, uh, I think those who posted uh, questions are still waiting anxiously. Uh, how long does the virus reside in the family of tubers as compared to the plant once it is infected? parent to child, grandchild, et cetera? Very good question. Uh, simple answer is that uh, we don't know yet. Uh, but again, evidence from so many different other uh, crops that are propagated through tubers, it turned out to be inconsistent. So there is no consistency or a pattern that uh, emerged. Uh, again, it depends on the virus and, and the, in this case, dahlia. So different viruses persist different periods of time in the same plant species, dahlia. So uh, we don't know exactly how long they will persist, but at least two or three generations is my guess that they would persist. And uh, depending on the growing conditions, uh, they may fail to multiply and get eliminated. So that's a big if. So that's why it's better not to keep the tubers from the infected plants. But you might, you might uh, want to add that some of the viruses are behave differently uh, than others in that regard specifically because the TSV, I have uh, examples where TSV has persisted in certain cultivars from generation to generation for, this would be seven generations and some others that, uh, you know, have disappeared uh, in right. a single year. But TSV in my view, uh, lasts forever. Exactly, thanks. <clears throat> thanks Dr. Minor, exactly. Tobacco streak virus is highly persistent and the other end of the spectrum, uh, tomato spotted wilt and a couple of other dahlia mosaic tend to be not so persistent in the tubers. So again, to make the story a little more complicated, <laughs> this persistence may differ from uh, dahlia variety to variety because the genetic composition is different. So some may suppress that persistence of a virus compared to other varieties. So 
Okay, so it depends on, on, on all these factors uh, to answer about persistence of A virus. So again, I told this joke so many times, probably you notice that my answers, most of them start with it depends. Mm -hmm. it, it's because of the, we are talking about different biological entities interacting and environment is a, another one that influences this interaction. So the outcome is very difficult to predict. So uh, in one of the very large potato growers meeting, I work on potato viruses because here Washington State, it's a multi, multi-billion crop. Uh, I told this joke so many times, uh, in one of the potato growers meeting, they were asking questions about viruses in potato, their persistence and whatnot. I didn't realize that every answer I'm starting with it depends. So one of the growers, uh, uh, Ron, uh, Ron, another Ron. Uh, so he also likes to ask questions like our doctor, Dr. Miner. So Ron uh, teased me. He said, Hanu, my next question, can you start your answer uh, without saying it depends? <laughs> so. I pretended that I thought very seriously and I said, it depends. <laughs> so everybody had a laugh. So, uh, yeah. Um, but that's a very good question. I, go, I get it a lot. Persistent, how persistent they are in tubers. And again, what is the practical implication? Uh, when we are testing for viruses, we use leaves to test the viruses, not tubers. So I get a lot of questions. How come? tubers are not being tested because again, the relative levels of the virus load is highly variable in tubers. Whereas in leaves, we have a lot of evidence that virus load is very high. So that is the optimal part of the plant to test if a plant has a virus. So tubers are not ideal for testing for viruses. And, oh, Thanks for your wonderful work on this subject, Dr. Papu. Oh, thank you. Uh, does good nutrition eventually assist the family of tubers in overcoming the virus? Very good question. Again, depends on the virus. Tobacco streak tends to persist for generations. Other viruses, absolutely. You, you probably they get eliminated. Uh, they are not able, if they're not able to keep up with the plant growth, uh, there's a very high likelihood they may get eliminated. And you will see the, 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 the result when you, the plants are up and growing um, and you can actually send a few healthy looking plants and get for testing, um, you know, to see if they are virus free. Uh, please give us the address where we should send out dahlias for testing. Yeah, it is all available on the uh, uh, ADS website, uh, a form to fill and all that. Virus stock put in the trash. Uh, you mean the infected, if something is in, found infected? Yeah, I think that, that would be fine in my opinion. Uh -huh. uh, in an earlier slide, you, were, you mentioned determining poor nutrition versus virus. Can you expand on this? Yes, uh, in terms of how the plants respond. Um, uh, virus infection, I showed you a few uh, slides showing a very specific stage of uh, reaction of the plant versus uh, nutritional disorders. At the first glance, they look like virus infections, but you, you should be able to distinguish them. Again, I encourage you to uh, uh, look at that YouTube video of a master's student uh, at North Carolina State. They specifically focused on uh, nutritional uh, disorders because we run into this situation, whether it's wheat or potato or apples or grapes. Uh, and nutrition can cause symptoms that mimic virus infection. Do hand spread virus, this buddy? Some viruses, yes. Stable viruses, tobacco streak, yes, we can, we can spread. If, if the plant that you are handling had virus. Again, some viruses tend to reach very high levels in the plant, others relatively low levels. So again, it depends on uh, the virus biology, uh, uh, it, it, how, how much it spread throughout the plant. Unfortunately, Dahlia societies in Canada cannot participate in virus project. Yes, unfortunately. Um, we got a, uh, in fact, we tried a pilot project to get uh, some samples from uh, Calgary, Alberta, 
our neighbor to the north. And uh, uh, in fact, I got my PhD from Alberta. So I, you know, uh, I thought, okay, this is my way of say, to saying them thanks. Uh, so they sent some samples, but again, we need a, a permit from USDA to uh, receive samples from uh, overseas. And uh, it's a long process. Uh, I managed to get a permit, um, but uh, when the samples were shipped from uh, near Calgary, uh, Southern Alberta, uh, uh, Lethbridge actually, uh, they first go to a quarantine station, a port of entry for us is Seattle. So the plants got stuck there for a couple of weeks and finally uh, they were released, uh, received them, and, but they're in totally bad shape, not, not in a condition to test for the viruses. Uh, so it is an issue. Um, I'm, I'm Actually, I have an appointment to talk to one of the uh, managers in AFIS in Washington, DC. Their headquarters is in, uh, in, in USDA headquarters is in DC. Uh, to discuss about this and how to make this process faster uh, to get samples from Canada. Again, uh, in the permit, they specify which part, which province of Canada the samples can come from and all that, uh, because the USDA is very particular about preventing introduction of any new pathogens into the country. That's their job, whether it's fungus or a bacterium or virus. Right? Uh, but uh, I, I am working on it to see how it can get uh, samples from Canada um, uh, into our testing program. Uh, because I'm from academic interest, I'm curious about what kind of viruses are prevalent in, in gardens in Canada versus US. So very, it will be very useful information. Um, any information on the persistence of infections in necrotic spot virus? Uh, good question. Relatively speaking, it's less persistent than tobacco streak. Um, and uh, that's all probably we know at this point of time. Uh, and uh, we have a small experiment going on in, 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 the, in the greenhouse here, starting with tubers from plants known to be infected with impatient necrotic spot and the subsequent plants and taking them through generations and testing them to see uh, how, how persistent uh, this virus is. Can you soak tubers in a bleach solution to deter virus and fungus? Very good question. I would not recommend it uh, because it's toxic, but for many other ornamental plants propagated through bulbs, uh, there are standardized protocols for hot water treatment. Soaking the tubers in hot water at a very specific temperature uh, for a defined duration. Uh, and that turned out to be very effective for nematodes. Nematodes are these tiny, tiny worms that live in soil and damage feed on plant roots. And uh, that's more of a problem in commercial agriculture here in Pacific Northwest, in Midwest, and what have you, on potatoes to wheat to soybean. Okay. Um, but uh, in case of ornamental bulb crops, uh, hot water treatment is, uh, is, is shown to be very effective for fungal diseases. Ah, yes, um, address for the website uh, for, for the testing is posted. We in Canada just need to invite uh, you and your lab here for summer. Uh, I'll be glad to, uh, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> As I said, uh, I, me and my wife, we both did PhDs in Alberta. So uh, it's, it's like our second home, um, even though it was an intellectual boot camp. Uh, and, Absolutely, um, uh, I'll be back stateside uh, end of July. Uh, after that, uh, you know, um, I'll definitely um, make an effort. Uh, just please, please uh, let let me know. Uh, you know, Virconis is disinfectant. Yes, okay, yeah. There's a link. Nice, thank you. If I cut on Sunday, ship on Monday, and it gets there on Thursday or Friday, is the sample fresh enough for you to test? Good question. Uh, yeah, yeah, typically we've been receiving samples by priority mail within, within the US, and usually they arrive by day three. So if you 
mail on day one, by day three, we could get them and they're in good shape. Uh, absolutely, yeah, Dr. Miner has been the architect behind uh, uh, getting this testing program off the ground. Uh, absolutely. All right, I think Thank that's you. the last last comment on the chat box. Uh, it's very nice to see quite a few joined the webinar. Uh, any other questions? If I don't know the answer, I just, I'll make it up. So don't hesitate. Give me your best shot. Hey, this is Heidi. I'm the, the North Central Trial, Trial Garden Director for this year. And I, I did have one question. I think you already answered it for us, but I just want to confirm. Um, so one of the things that I was thinking about um, keeping accessible for our members working out there is like, you know, for ease of cleaning tools between every plant, you know, and, and how can we make it as easy as possible to make sure that people are doing it? And I was wondering, you know, with all the COVID stuff that we've been dealing with, um, and like like you were saying, all those hand sanitizers, and they're like, oh, it kills, you know, 99.9% .9 of viruses. And so I was wondering if having like Clorox bleach wipes or, you know, hand sanitizer to put on our tools in between, I mean, is that a good way? Or is it like you said, more hype than, than fact? Yeah, these sanitizers have a limited use. They're not useless, but uh, uh, studies have, they tried all different kinds of these disinfectants. And so they're not totally ineffective, but, uh, different research groups looked for what is the most effective disinfectant. Sure. So it turned out bleach and the detergent Dawn and Vircon. Uh, so they are most effective. Uh, again, there's not much significant difference between them. So uh, yeah, Clorox wipes, they are effective. I'm not saying they are totally ineffective, but how effective they are. Uh, it turned out these treatments are most effective. And in fact, Ron Miner uh, perfected this in, in his garden where he uses bleach and uh, I believe Don as well. And uh, maybe, maybe uh, Ron, uh, you want to? Yeah, I, uh, let me just uh, comment that the, it's pretty simple to put a, a Gatorade bottle of 10% bleach in a small bucket that is filled with a, uh, intense Dawn solution dip it in the, in the bleach and then dip it in the bucket. And, uh, you know, a matter of, uh, you know, uh, a few seconds and uh, it's accomplished. So that's pretty easy. Uh, and I guess if you had a big crew, you might want to do a couple buckets like that, but it's right. pretty simple. And, and so it's, it's, and you said it's pretty quick. So there's not a lot of like evaporation time or anything like that required. I mean, can you wipe it off or does it need to dry on its own? Heidi, my experience is that you can dip it and, you know, <laughs> swish it through the air and use it. Okay, perfect. But didn't you say we can carry it on our hands and on our garden gloves? So what do we do about that? Yeah, typically what we do is, uh, for, because for, for, for you know, research material in the greenhouse, uh, <clears throat> We have a, a spray bottle with 70% alcohol and we con consistent, continuously keep uh, rubbing spray alcohol on our hands and rub until they ev it evaporates very quickly. And again, with the exception of tobacco street, otherwise are not as stable. And, and so, be, so that, that will really help. If you make up a, a bottle of 10% uh, bleach, um, you know, we tend to carry our bottle around in our bucket for a month or two. Uh, do I lose effectiveness after how long with that bleach? Uh, yes, very good question. Uh, in fact, yeah, with the bleach, that is another downside of it. So it, you, you see that it changes color 
Uh, and so it, it's important not to, yeah. I think Ron Miner has, uh, I think the last time we discussed, I think with Linda and Ron. Uh, yeah. Even within the uh, virus team, there are variations in practice. Uh, I, I think that a month is way too long. I, I think you need to put in a, uh, I would even change uh, solutions uh, in a day within a day, if I'm doing something like uh, uh, cutting up tubers or, you know, something that's very intense. Uh, but ordinarily, I would think that, a, you know, a fresh solution will last through a day working in, you know, in the garden and maybe even a couple days, uh, but not a whole lot. As inexpensive as bleach is, it's pretty easy to, to just replace it. Right. Yeah, I, I think that, uh, I'm sorry, I think that if you're going to go to the effort of, you know, doing that, you're going from plant to plant with, you know, disinfecting uh, between plants, that by not changing your solutions at the end of the day or before the next day, I think, uh, and, and again, what Ron was saying about the cost of the bleach. I think that would be a, a egregious error. I think you just got to do that. I think I think maybe the bleach deteriorates faster than the Dawn solution. Dawn, right? But yeah. you know, it's it's pretty. And in fact, I guess I ha should say I also have uh, merely <coughs> dumped out a little of the bleach solution and added more bleach. Uh, that's a you know an option that I have used, like within a day. Yeah, and. Here is a question on the chat box. If you suspect fungus in another plant in your garden, how do you treat the ground? Remove the soil completely. Good question. Uh, I would recommend first thing would be to get the fungus identified. I think your local university extension service should be able to do that. Uh, your county should have a, a university extension service uh, because not all fungi cause disease. So some of them just live in the soil. And so it's important to know that if that particular fungus is actually causing, uh, damaging the plant. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and they would then recommend what, what to do then if it is a pathogen. Mm -hmm. And can you accommodate for testing end plants of a foot tall with a developed vascular system in late June and July? Uh, I, absolutely, yes. The foliage is what we use to test. Any other questions or comments? Well, thank you again for educating us today. Um, this is wonderful and I'm so happy that you could do it. And thank you all for joining us today. And happy. again, my, yeah, my email address is all on my, on my website. If you just on Google, if you type my last name, Papu and WSU, uh, my website will come up. It has my contact information, phone number, email, everything. So just please, any questions, uh, send me an email. Um, I'll try to respond within 24 hours. Uh, if you don't hear from me, please send me a reminder. Hey, Hanu, wake up. You know, now that I am in uh, Spain, I'm trying not to get used to these afternoon siestas. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but I'll be, yeah, I'll try to usually try to respond within, within a day. Thank you so much. Um, I, and then there is a question, how do I plan on sharing the recording? Um, I think I'll, ju I'll just send the link out to okay. um, the Midwest uh, Dahlia and, and they can share. All right. Thank you. Very good. Thank you, everybody. Thanks again. Okay, bye. Thank you. Bye.